<laughs> so the meeting is live. Yeah, yeah. I'm just. It will take one more minute because the setting of the meeting on YouTube. Where is Mohan? Is not come. Yeah, he's there. Doctor Mohan Desai is there. You can see. He has just uh, off his video. Doctor Mohan Desai, can you hear Doctor Nand Anta? Yes, I can. I can. Yes, yes. Hi, 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 hi. I am here. Here. Yeah, your voice. Yeah. How is Daddy? Fine. Uh, he's okay. He's all right. Yeah. Hey, Parai. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. How are you, Parai? Very well, thank you. Yeah. All well, all well at your place? I'm all well, all well. Yeah. Russian. Kumar, how are you? Yeah, yeah, fine, fine. Uh, Parag. Sir, good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. Oh, yes. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. Oh, why can't I? Why can't I see you on top? Yesterday, you are the king. Ah, oh. <laughs> so why can't I see you today? Well, I always found to be on the background. Yeah, you are hiding. Anyway, di chiamare, di informarsi. E adesso niente, non ci riuscite a parlare, Pratap, you are working uh, full day? Yes. Or, in, or still in quarantine? No, no, it's not in quarantine. But unfortunately, I had a fever today. So I am off for a few days. I see. <laughs> I don't know what it's, whether it's corona or I just have, uh, you know. Fear, fear fever. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Dr. Anta, the program has started. I think I'll request Dr. Parag Munshi and Dr. Jitender uh, Maheshwari to yeah. take over from now because Sanjay Trivedi will be joining us late. So I'll request, uh, and today's speaker is Dr. Giovanni Giacomo from Italy. He's going to speak on anatomical shoulder replacement and the reverse shoulder replacement principles in biomechanics. And after that, he's going to have, uh, we're, we're going to have case-based discussion. John is going to show us few cases and take our opinion and what he has done. So it is going to be a very, very interactive session. I'll hand over complete session to Dr. Parag Munshi and Dr. Jitain Maheshwari. Introduce him, no? Introduce him. So, uh, 
good evening everyone thank you roshan thank you academy for getting us on and thank you dr maheshwari so uh, dr giovanni this reverse shoulder and your anatomical shoulder has generated a lot of interest uh, all over india in the last 5 years as what's happening globally the number of reverse shoulders are being put in which is much more and is, is also a bit of a scary trend so we want to listen to you and then understand what are your principles and how are you deciding when you're putting in your anatomical and when you're deciding on the reverse shoulder so with that we'll kick off with your talk and then we'll go for the interactive session and we'll take uh, questions from the audience and the panelists so over to you now dr giovanni can you hear us are you with us uh, he is uh, he is still muted he is still muted yeah he just started screen sharing okay yeah so i'll just mute all john i'll just mute all so that nobody can disturb the meeting and you are unmuted so that you can speak can you hear me yes yes we can hear you perfect can you remember can you just a moment no problem take your time okay Okay. Tell me if you can see the video yes. on the left side. Yes. You have a classic uh, video of anatomic. For uh, anatomic means that you have to reconstruct the anatomy of the shoulder. You can see that there is a convexity of the humeral head, and that there is a concavity of the glenoid component. The cuff is the key point. If you don't have a cuff, of course, without the cuff, and you have an anatomic uh, prosthesis. These prosthesis cannot work because uh, the missing of the calf lead to a superior translation, subluxation of the humeral head. When you miss the calf, the only way to restore a functional shoulder is uh, to reverse the anatomy. It means a concavity on the humerus and convexity on the glenoid, as you can see. So we are going to create a new fulcrum and the engine of the shoulder this time is the deltoid. On the left side of the screen, you have an X-ray view of anatomic. And on the right, see, reverse. I will speak in the 420 minutes about anatomic and the main indication of uh, anatomic prosthesis, the main indication is uh, arthritis of the glenohumeral joint. Of course, there is uh, some uh, important rules. There are many rules that are the key point, but uh, the patient selection is very important. When we speak about patient selection, I mean uh, those are patients that complain pain, and of course, they, they have a limited range of motion. A very simple, very cheap X-ray, like the true AP, if well performed, can you be, can give you immediately a good idea about the cartilage between the humeral head and the glenoid. You can see a normal AP on the left side, and you can see all the signs that you know very well of the arthritis on the right part of the screen. Osteophytis, the restriction of the line between the head and the glenoid, and the subchondral uh, uh, bone density that is much than the normal density. This is a classical picture of glenohumeral arthritis. Very interesting is the tipping point. What means tipping point? Tipping points is when he is the right moment to give surgery to our patients. And of course, we can discuss about this. This is a, the right shoulder you can see is a fine. On the left side is painful. There is a limitation. Is not functional, 
very often they try rehabilitation. They do some injection of cortisol of hyaluronic acid. And when they are tired because they failure, especially if they are in their 50, in their 60, they deserve a good quality of the life. In my, my, in my hand, they are ready for anatomic. So I will focus the attention on anatomic. When we want or we, when we would like to, uh, to work with anatomic prosthesis, we have to give a look to the soft tissue, to the bone tissue. When I speak about soft tissue, I mean we have to give a look to the calf. Normally, the calf is not perfect, but when there are no anatomical lesion, there is a normal muscle or some fat infiltration or grade two or gluteal classification that of course you know very well, probably total shoulder atroplasty can work. When you have a poor calf, grade three, grade four of gluteal classification, probably a reverse shoulder arthroplasty can work because this is the good situation, good calf, good, prosthesis, anatomic prosthesis. So you have a good fulcrum and you have a good engine. The engine is the calf. But if you don't have a good calf, and sometimes it is not easy to evaluate the calf to perform anatomic, you have a nightmare. You need to reoperate your patient after a few months. So the patient selection is very important. So you have to study with CT scan or with MRI, and there are many classifications, there are many signs that can help you to have some information about the fat infiltration and about the atrophy of the muscles around the humeral head, like the fish, bend box sign, tangent sign of Danetti, and so on. The second step, very important, is uh, the bone quality. When I speak about bone quality, I mean the humeral head and the glenoid. And there are very precise rules that I will speak about now. So we have uh, mainly five different rules regarding the bond. Very important is that we have uh, very clear when we speak about the classification of the glenoid, the drill valve classification. There are different types of glenoid. One is very simple, A1, A2, you can see here, it means that you have a concentric arthritis. It means that is very important, it's very simple. The head is centered into the glenoid and you have an erosion of the glenoid in the middle of the glenoid. That's the reason we call this uh, concentric arthritis. And the humeral head is not, not, is not subluxated. When we speak about B1, B2, B3, it means that in B1, there is a posterior subluxation of the head. In B and the arthritis, in B2, there is a B concave. We call this one paleoglenoid and we call this one neoglenoid. And uh, probably B3 is an evolution of B2. Then very rare in my experience is, uh, B, uh, is type C where you have a retroversion because the glenoid dysplasia is like a congenic uh, disease, or very rare is a static anterior uh, subluxation with anterior erosion of the glenoid. But the most frequent in my experience is A2, B1, B2. I will speak in this talk about two cases. One is concentric that you can see on the left side, and we can call this easy surgery because there is no so much to correct. But on the right side, it's very interesting. This is a patient that was operated one year before in another hospital. They did an endoprosthesis, but uh, is coming to me after rehabilitation with a lot of pain and uh, no full range of motion. You can see here. So I will speak about concentric and eccentric case. 
and now we will see the surgery step by step. Someone is the same, someone is different when we treat concentric and eccentric pathology. This is the first case, concentric. It means that the head is centered and there is a concentric erosion of the glenoid. On the right side, very important, you can see that is a B2 case and the first surgeon did not decide to correct the B2, he did only the humeral head, and this is the B2. You can see that there is a posterior subluxation of the head, there is a posterior erosion, we call this a neoglenoid, this is the paleoglenoid. This is the right version, this is the wrong version, is retroverted glenoid because it's B2. So the female patient is A2, the male patient is B2, two different cases. One very easy, the second one, eccentric, is more difficult. So soft tissue management. We are going to begin our surgery in concentric and eccentric. The incision for us is always the same. This anterior incision is going, this is left shoulder, is going to begin close to the coracoid. We go distal and lateral, more or less 10, 12 centimeters. Concentric and eccentric is the same. We look for the deltopectoral approach. The, the surgery is very important to begin superiorly where the coracoid is. Here, where is, there is the fatty tissue, you can find the cephalic vein. That is a very important as a landmark, as a cleavage between the deltoid on the right side and pectoralis major on the left. The position of the retractor is very important. We have a self-retractor, one OMA retractor on the coracoid. You can see here the subscap and the three sister. You can coagulate the three sister. You can ligate the three sister. This is very important to close this artery because the bleeding, the risk of the bleeding that you can have during the surgery or after the surgery. Then we can speak about how to open the joint through a tenotomy one centimeter middle to the biceps, through the pill, or to osteotomy of tuberosity. I had the privilege to attend a few months ago on January, Salt Lake City meeting with uh, different surgeons around the world. And the different paper, they have shown that there is no difference to, between tenotomy, pill, osteotomy. It means that if you perform the technique, doesn't matter which one, in the right way, there is no clinical difference in the medial or long follow-up. We prefer the tenotomy. So it's left shoulder, we tenotomize the subscap from proximal to distal, and we are going a little medial. And uh, we open the tendon and we open the capsula. Very is important is that you put some stay suture on the subscap as a landmark. And very important in uh, our experience is to perform a capsulotomy and the most inferior part of the humeral head from lateral to medial to improve the visualization of the humeral head after the dislocation. And if you perform with the slight external rotation, a very good capsulotomy, very close to the neck, while your assistant is going to externally rotate the humeral head, you have an automatically dislocated humeral head, like in this case. In the case one, in the contrary case, we perform with freehand cut the osteotomy of the head. We respect the version and we have to respect the valgus -bal 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 angles of the humeral. You have to keep in mind that usually we have 20, 30 degree of retroversion and 135 degree of valgus angle. But very, very important is that to keep in mind the Pascal Ballot and Jill Walsh study where they have shown that the center of the humeral head does not match with the center of the, the, the center of the diaphysis. There is an eccentricity of the humeral head that is medial and posterior. This is very important because the manufacturer of the prosthesis now have a modulated prosthesis. 
that can adapt the humeral component perfectly to the anatomy of the humeral head according to this study. So in the simple case, concentric one, we are going to prepare the diaphysis in a very standard way as you make for the hip surgery. We do this with the metaphysial press fit prosthesis. We create the humeral canal with the progressive and uh, with the dedicated tools, we have to respect, we have to compress the spongious bone and we have to respect the retroversion of the humeral component that usually is between 20 and 30 degrees. We call this anatomic because we respect the retroversion, we respect the barus barus angle, we respect the eccentricity of the humeral head component respect to the diaphysis, and we respect the conformity of the humeral head respect to the glenoid. Of course, we have different proof, and we have to adapt our prosthesis to the anatomy of our patients. This is a, a classical step of a concentric case that I call easy case. Then I have to protect the head because the, the following steps are on the glenoid and I will put my refractory here over the humerus and I want to protect the bone. This is case two, eccentric one. This was the young patient that had the previous surgery in another hospital and he had a B2 glenoid that was not treated. So we have to remove the head. It's like a revision case. We have to transform endoprosthesis in an anatomic total prosthesis because the B2 component on the glenoid. So in this case, we were very lucky. We did everything like the concentric, but of course, we have to remove to work on the head, the, the stem, especially if the stem, like in this case, is not well fixed. So we want to look for a better stability. If it was very stable, of course, we don't remove that. So you can see at this point, we are at the same point of the concentric case. Then we have to work on the scapula. To work on the scapula is very important because once again, you have to know the anatomy. We are working for anatomy prosthesis. So you have to keep in mind that usually there is a down rotation or upward rotation, or you can call downward tilt or upward tilt of the glenoid that range between less five or five plus the inclination. And also the retroversion is very close to zero. We don't want to have too much retroversion, no more than 10 degree of retroversion. And usually the antiversion is between zero and five, no more. So the antiversion is five, less five, and retroversion is tolerate until less 10, negative. So this is the anatomy of the normal shoulder. And when we speak about anatomic in a concentric, we have to remember that we have a disruption of the middle of the glenoid. When it's eccentric, we have to work to restore the normal anatomy because we have a biconcave glenoid like the B2. So are two different issues. This is the case, simple case. Is the concentric one, it's very easy because there is no deformity, but anyway, we want a very good exposure of the glenoid. This is the left shoulder. You can see that humeral head is here. We have an anterior retractor between the subscap and the anterior neck. We have the superior uh, retractor at the level of the biceps that was tenomized. And there is another retractor that is in the most posterior inferior part of the glenoid and uh, is creating the space between the head and the posterior part of the glenoid. This is a perfect end phase view ready for our surgery. We want a very good view of the glenoid because this is a very delicate step of our surgery. And you can realize that there is a pear shape of the glenoid. 
Of course, we can have a different measure with MRI, with the CN, the CT scan, with the computer. But when it's a concentric, there is no big problem because more or less the inclination of the glenoid is a 90 degree, 90 degree respect the axis of the scapula that we call this the Freeman line. So A2 is a concentric and there are no big issue, it's easier. You can see this is the type of arthritis that we want to treat. So which are the steps we have to do? Left shoulder, anterior retractor, posterior retractor, superior one. Most of the time, three retractor are enough, but we have to try to have the best view of our glenoid. And it's up to the different type of the prosthesis. We use the prosthesis that is very precise. We can measure the angle of proximal distal and anterior posterior curve of the glenoid. moment. Okay. There are, of course, dedicated instruments. There are different phantom. You have to insert the key wire. Very, very important is the inclination in antiversal retroversion, superior and inferior inclination. Then you can use a reamer, but you have not to ream too much because it's not like the hip, just some millimeters of a cartilage, we, want, we, we don't want to disturb the subchondral bone. Then uh, we make a central hole. And with this uh, instrument, we make a superior and inferior hole for the keel. You can use keel, peg, a little, little to a little confusing for some surgeons, pegs works better than keel. For others, there is some advantage of the keel. Once again, long-term long follow-up will tell us it is better. Very important that most of the prostheses are in polyethylene and are cemented because the metal back have shown that there is osteolysis of the component. So it's a very difficult that you have a very good long follow-up with metal back. So till now we prefer poly polyethylene with cemented. Of course, you have not to put too much cement into the glenoid, but just into the hole. We don't want uh, cement between uh, the polyethylene and the bone, just where the pegs or the keel kills. And uh, you need the compression more or less for 10 minutes to give the best compression. And this time we, we wait for some minutes and the glenoid is ready. This is very easy because it's concentric. Different is when it's eccentric. Case B, the second case, the male case, the revision case. So we have to work on these patients and the anatomy situation of the glenoid is different. It's like a B2. You can see that this is the paleoglenoid. There is a subluxation of the humeral head and this is the retroversion angle. So we have to treat the subluxation and we have to treat the retroversion. Of course, we can use the computer. There are, we use usually the blueprint, but to use the computer is uh, easy. I want to explain you which is in the mind of the computer to solve the problem. Then the problem can solve the problem in easy way, but I think that the surgeon need to understand which are the rules that the computer uses to give you the best information how to place the glenoid component. That in B2 is very hard, is very difficult. So you can use the computer, but you have to understand what the computer is doing. So first of the problem here is that the subluxation is an issue. And probably 
the subluxation, the posterior subluxation of humeral head is the cause of the B2. And this is very important because if we place a glenoid, but we have a, a posterior dislocation, we have this effect. We have an overload on the posterior prosthesis component of the glenoid, and we can have in few years, between five, six, eight years, the mobilization of the glenoid component. This is the problem that probably still now is not completely solved when we treat with anatomy prosthesis, the B2. And there is an open discussion around the world, especially in B2 with posterior subluxation that is around 90%. Many surgeons, especially if the patient is not so young, they prefer to use directly a reverse prosthesis. We can discuss, but of course, if we are treating, treating a patient that is 40, that is 50, probably we can use an anatomic prosthesis, try to correct the glenoid. How can we correct the glenoid? There are three main instruments. One is asymmetric rim. Second is the graft. Third, for me, the most important is rim and replace. What means asymmetric rimming? It's very easy. If you are in this situation, you can rim the most anterior part and you can have a B2 that is transformed in A1, A2. You miss some bone, of course, but you have a normal concavity of the glenoid. If you give a look to the literature, you can do this until uh, 10 degree, 15 degree of retroversion. And you have to measure the spine, you have to measure the paleoglenoid, you have to measure the neoglenoid. Very important is the concept of intermediate glenoid. And of course, you have to rim the yellow zone to, have, uh, to restore the new concavity. So there is some biomechanics around this that you need to understand. The angle of a correction is alpha angle. So you have to put your drill not in this position perpendicular to the intermediate glenoid, but you have to correct with the alpha angle and you restore the anatomy of the glenoid. But you miss, of course, some bone. That's the reason that there is some downsides of the medial rimming. It means that with, with medial rimming, you are going more medial and going more medial, you can see you have a smaller vault, you have a, a more medial vault, you have a different conformity and the, 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 the concept of conformity is very important. The ideal, the magic number, is six, the difference of the radius of the humeral head and the radius of the glenoid. And of course, the more medial you are, the less lever of the cuff you have. So we advise to correct retroversion no more than 10, 15 degrees. There is no, of course, a precise number, but when you, you need a correction that is 20, 22, 25, it's too much in our hand the high rimming. The second possibility, especially in a young person, you can use the graft, but now you, we use the graft mostly in reverse because uh, we are trying since uh, different years, rim and replace. What means? It means that you, if you have a, an important B2, I mean an important retroversion, you have to rim here, you have to rim here a little so we don't miss bone. We are not too much medialized. We, we have a good bone block, but you need, of course, a dedicated glenoid component with a wedge. So you need a, a dedicated company, component of the glenoid with different wedge. And of course, you need dedicated instrument, which is the key point. Look this video, this is a B2. I want to rim only the paleoglenoid, a little, one, two millimeters, just arrive to the subchondral bone. So I am going to rim the paleoglenoid 
and with a dedicated rimmer, now I will rim the neoglenoid. You can see that I don't remove so much bone. Now with this dedicated drill that is angled, I have different angle, 15, 25, 35. I can rim the posterior glenoid without bone loss, without high dreaming, because if I would do high dreaming, I arrive here. In this case, I remove a little bone here, and I have a good, very good lateralization of the glenoid component without too much dreaming. And I restore the zero degree of retroversion. And this point, I have a good anatomy because I have a stepped glenoid. And the other key point is to replace the good eccentricity also of the human head company to restore the Gothic arc. So this is the case two before the surgery. And I show you this is, you can see the chondrolysis on the most posterior part is a, a B2 at the early stage, but was very painful for the patient. So we did, uh, with the dedicated rimmer, we are rimming the paleoglenoid. This is the right shoulder. We are rimming the most anterior part, but a little, the most anterior part of the glenoid that is the paleo. And with this angled rimmer, we are rimming the neoglenoid, the posterior one. So we are still lateral. We are not disturbing too much the valve. At this point, I use a stepped glenoid with the peg, with the kill. But the very important is the concept that I have a wedge posteriorly and I replace exactly the anatomy. The glenoid is perpendicular to the Freeman line and I am going to restore a B2 in A1, A2. And so I need a good seating and I can study the seating with the computer before the surgery, of course, but I want that we understand very well which is the ratio of this kind of surgery. And of course, you know, there are a lot of computer that can give you the type the, can assist you, but you have to know what they are doing. Then we go back, it is the same for concentric and eccentric. We are going back on the humeral head. In my head, these steps are a little easier, but it does not mean that you have to put the head and you finish, because there is some stability test that is very, very important. There are dedicated head and then you can use low on height eccentricity because we want to cover all the stotomy cut and we want our head that is flush with the tuberosity. But not only this, it's very important, of course, to cover the stotomy cut, but we, all have, we have also to save some anterior bone to reconstruct, to repair the subscap. And very, very important is to check again the posterior stability or instability of the prosthesis. Because especially in the centric one, you can have still some posterior instability. So it's a very important to test with the posterior load and you have to dislocate, subluxate the head and you have to replace. In this case, it's perfect. But sometimes you can have still some posterior instability before repairing the subscap. So you have to restore the stability. So during this test, if the head is going to subluxate and reduce immediately, we are fine, it's okay. But if doesn't restore into the, if the head remain posterior and that does not go back into the glenoid, you have different solution. One, you need the much more thickness of the humeral head. And very interesting is the reverse, reverse offset, or you can plicate posteriorly, or some surgeons in this case of severe instability, they shift to the reverse. What means reverse offset? Reverse offset means 
that you have to turn your humeral head going with the convexity more anterior. The more anterior is the convexity of the eccentricity, the more difficult has the humeral head to stay dislocated posteriorly. So the reverse offset is very, very important. You can see here. That, that's the key point. You need to have humor component that have high and low eccentricity. This is important to restore the anatomy, to cover the stotomy, but also to try to improve the, the stability, especially in B3, in B2. When you are you have reached a good stability of the head. Of course, we perform some hole close to the lesser tuberosity. Then we cement or we use press fit component and we prefer to avoid cement. This is the final comp uh, component, the stem and the humeral head. This is a press fit, is a metaphysical press fit. It's a short stem, less than 10 centimeters. And then very, very important is uh, to make a good repair of the subscap. When we repair the subscap, also to have uh, a good uh, stress shielding, we, we fix, we repair also the rotator interval. And uh, we use the fires that we pass through the bone and we restore the anatomy. This is the case number one, left shoulder at one here. You can see that we have a good elevation, good external rotation, very good uh, external rotation in the adduction, a good internal rotation. This was the easy case because it was uh, a concentric arthritis. And this is uh, the more difficult case. You can see that uh, at uh, two months, very close to the surgery, we have, we, through the same incision, we have a good range of motion and the patient is laughing. There's no more complaint pain because we solve the problem of the B2 glenoid. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gioni. That was a wonderful talk on anatomic uh, shoulder replacement. Uh, is there any question to Dr. Gioni on this? Uh -huh. Yeah. So. I'll start with the question. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, ah, yeah. Dr. Giovanni, yes. wonderful, wonderful talk, very clear exposure. So I have one first question to you is, uh, do you think that shoulder hemi replacement, is it dead? And what is the trend all across Europe? Are you still doing shoulder hemis or is everyone doing total and reverse only? No, can, can, you, can you repeat the, the, the question, please? Do you think that shoulder hemi replacement is a dead procedure? Are people in Europe and in Italy doing that, or is it now on the downswing? Uh, Jenny, this is regarding partial replacement, hemi replacement. Oh, I, mean, I did uh, hemi replacement, but uh, sometimes I had some glenoiditis, and uh, I had to reoperate my patients and to replace the glenoid. So, in my experience, it's not so clear when uh, I need to make an endoprosthesis or a total anatomy. Most of the time I do total anatomy, uh, but no fractures, of course. Thank you. Do you, do you believe in uh, arthroscopy for osteoarthritis in younger people? Yes, I think that uh, to perform bursectomy, capsulotomy, to make a good toilet of the humeral head, especially if it is a concentric arthritis, it makes sense. Probably you can uh, uh, save time. But once again, as I told you at the beginning of my talk, the tipping point is a key point. Sometimes uh, we have the habit, many, as many years ago, when we were uh, giving indication to the knee prosthesis, to the hip prosthesis in Italy, we use uh, to say our patient, you have to wait, you have to wait, you have to wait maybe two, 10, five years. I don't know if we can apply this philosophy to the arthritis of the shoulder, because if they wait too much time, they lose the calf, and so you have to switch to a reverse. So sometimes uh, I think that to try to avoid the anatomic is good, 
but not for too much time. Otherwise, uh, when you treat your patient with anatomic, your calf is weak. There is a fat infiltration, there is uh, atrophy. So the tipping point is very interesting point. So uh, Dr. Gioni. Yeah, 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 Jitin, go ahead. Yeah, can you just explain the stripping point a little bit? Yeah, tipping point, it means uh, when you have a patient that comes to you with arthritis, that uh, from the uh, imaging point of view is ready for uh, prosthesis. My question here is, but you have not to give indication only on the X-ray, but also on the pain and limitation. Uh, sometimes I realize that some patients have uh, an X-ray, a CT that is very severe, but they are not so much painful. They don't have so much important limitation and they are not so prone to have surgery. Mm. So they are not re ready for the tipping point. They are not ready to decide to make surgery. There are other patients where the X-ray is not so terrible, but they are very painful. They have a, a great limitation. They did any kind of rehabilitation and they come to you and they ask, doctor, you have to help me. I don't want to live in this way because my social life is a nightmare. I don't sleep anymore. I can't win, I can't do nothing. They are ready for surgery. That's the tipping point. But sometimes it's not clear. It's up to you, it's up to your patient. Maybe that the tipping point for you is different from my tipping point. I don't know if it's clear my answer. Yeah, okay. So what you're saying essentially is that patient decides about surgery based on his symptoms. Right? Now, very yeah. often when the patient is in too much pain and you just give him a shot of cortisone, he improves. Yes. You think that will be okay to have that kind of approach? Yes. If they are young, if, if, if they uh, do one or two cortisone injection, maybe we can do. But the information to the patients need to be very clear because there is some study they have demonstrated the more injection, the more shoot you do, the more, the more risk of infection you can have. So I think that the information to the patient is the key point. And it's not so clear the tipping point because as I told you before, we can save time, but I don't know if it's good for the calf to save time before arriving to the prosthesis. Because maybe that uh, you have pain, I do injection, you make rehabilitation, and uh, you will do the anatomic prosthesis in five years instead of uh, in two years. But in five years, the calf is not like the calf if you perform the surgery after two years. So the- uh, Journey, journey yeah. I, have a, I have a question for you. There are two questions. One is, uh, what is the longevity of this anatomic process since it is done with the cuff very much intact? Does, does the biomechanics of the shoulder changes and does the longevity goes down? Because the moment you have intact cuff, he is going to use that shoulder more often. You know, he is going to use that shoulder more frequently as compared to the uninjured shoulder. So does it lead to the uh, early failures, especially when you see the younger population? Yes, I think that when we speak about this, we have to uh, look at what kind of patient we are speaking. If we are speaking about concentric or eccentric arthritis, if you are speaking about uh, concentric arthritis, probably the longevity of the prosthesis is between 15 years, 20 years. It's different the follow-up when we follow our patient with B2. Because if you ask to Pascal, if you ask to Gilles Valsh, which is the cause of B2, it's not clear. We don't know if the B2 is because uh, a displa dysplastic uh, glenoid or is because uh, a posterior stress, a posterior dislocation of humeral head for muscle imbalance. So if you have muscle imbalance and you do a good job, but maybe that the muscles after five, 10 years, they try to push the head posteriorly again and you have a mobilization of the glenoid company. So probably longevity in B2 is shorter than uh, longevity in A1, A2. Pratap, you have a question, Pratap? Pratap, you can hear me, Pratap? Uh, yeah, Dr. Anto? Yeah. Excellent lecture. Thank you.
um, uh, in trauma, we get a lot of trauma in uh, 55, 60 years old, where the glenoid is very good, no arthritis. In that situation, what do you advise? Absolutely. When is a, there is a fracture, three type, three, um, three, uh, three part, four, four parts fracture, I, of course, uh, I, I use uh, anatomic trauma prosthesis. I don't work on the glenoid. The big problem in uh, this uh, trauma anatomic uh, prosthesis are the tuberosity, because you know very well that the functional results depends on the healing on the tuberosity on the stem on the diaphysis. Uh, sometimes uh, you have uh, osteolysis of the tuberosity, and after a few months, you have a, have a pseudo paralytic uh, uh, shoulder. That is very important that you use. Uh, uh, um, prosthesis that can be transformed in reverse without removing the stem, the platform prosthesis. But do you have some tips and tricks to uh, for tuberosity fixation so that they don't have problem? Uh, yes, of course. There are different techniques that are described by Sotelo and Pascal Ballot. When you you need to put stitch between the lesser tuberosity. The, the big tuberosity across each other and also to put holes on the diaphysis to give the best compression. And uh, if they heal, the process is worked. If they don't heal, uh, is, is a big problem. Uh, Johnny, I have a question on B2 type of lesion. When you do B2, B2 surgery for the B2, the glenosphere, whenever it seats, and you are using the uh, a wedge on that uh, glenoid defect. Uh, can't it be filled with some kind of bone graft, like what we do in t total knee replacement? Yes, so of can course. We... Yes, yeah, 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 you can use uh, the graft, but according to the Jill Valsh uh, uh, study, there is a big rate of reabsorption of the graft behind the, the glenoid. That's the reason we are trying uh, glenoid with a wedge. I think that it uh, uh, is better than the graft. The graft in my hand is, is working very well when I do a lateralized a bio reverse, but in reverse in another chapter. So Dr. Giovanni, I was quite impressed with your glenoid exposure. Mm. Uh, any tips? Yes, the, the, the main tips is a, a very good uh, capsulotomy all around the humeral head. And if you stay with the, your cautery very close to the neck of the humerus, you are safe for the nerve, for the plexus, and you need a, an assistant that is going to externally rotate, and you make a very, very precise capsulotomy. Sometimes it can be useful to make a tenotomy of one uh, centimeters of pectoralis uh, major when the, 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 the shoulder is very stiff. And uh, you can use uh, more, more, most of the time three, three retractors. One is between the subscap and uh, the glenoid neck. One is uh, at 12 o'clock, and the other one is uh, posterior inferior. And there is a trick, according uh, to some surgeon, to improve the, um, the view of the glenoid. You have, you, you have to externally rotate the humerus and uh, push the third proximal of the humerus posteriorly with external rotation. This could improve your view, but you have to pay attention not to externally rotate too much. Otherwise, you can have a strain on the plexus. So do you normally do a posterior capsulotomy all the time? No, no, no. Especially if there is a tendency to the posterior subluxation, I save the posterior capsula uh, just to save uh, the posterior instability. But in a, in a, in a, not a posterior subluxation, say in a, a type of glenoid, do you routinely do a posterior capsulotomy to yes. improve, yes. improve your yes. exposure? Absolutely, yeah. yes. Okay. Dr. Giovanni, my question to you is, when a primary total shoulder wears out or it fails in a concentric glenoid, what is your way of looking at a reverse or have you done Re revision shoulder replacements when the first shoulder fails. Uh, can you pick because I, I missed something because the the, the, the voice was uh, out. 
You are speaking about anatomic in a concentric? Yes. So in a concentric anatomical shoulder replacement, which wears out, and when you have to do a revision surgery, do you have any experience of doing a second revision with an anatomical shoulder, wherein okay. you've reconstructed the glenoid? Are you going for a reverse shoulder with glenoid reconstruction? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to reverse most of the time. I remove the glenoid component and I make uh, uh, most of the time a reverse. It's very, it's very rare in my experience to make a revision anatomic on uh, anatomic. There are surgeons that describe that it is possible, but you need a very good cuff. If you have a very, very good cuff, it makes sense if you don't have a huge bone loss. But in, in my practice, it's very, very rare. Most of the time when I do a revision for an anatomic, I shift directly with the platform uh, to, the, to the reverse. And it's not easy surgery because sometimes uh, it's very easy to remove the glenoid, but sometimes it's very hard to remove the, the glenoid and you need some allograph to reconstruct the glenoid to put your uh, uh, glenosphere. Is there any role for uncemented glenoid, uh, Dr. Gioni? Uh, I, I hope so. For now, anatomic. Yeah, yes, for anatomic. I, I hope so because it means that if we are ready and some um, researcher, uh, they are doing hybrid, hybrid glenoid. And uh, it should be very nice that if you need uh, to make a revision from anatomic uh, to reverse on the humeral side now, because the platform, it's very easy, but it's very difficult now to work on the glenoid side because you have to remove your component. But if you have a metal back that you not need to remove and you can put your glenosphere on the metal back, it should be great. But there are very short follow-up. In my experience uh, reading the literature, there are no surgeons that have a long follow-up with metal back in anatomic now. Dr. Giovanni, uh, we know that in an anatomic shoulder, the incidence of glenoid complication is as high as almost 25%. And we also know that if the glenoid fails, you are more or less pushed to a reverse. Yeah. So in this situation, uh, where is the role of hemiarthroplasty, something like resurfacing, or a stemless hemi, where even if over a period of time, some amount of medial glenoid erosion happens, which happens yes. in about 20%. You are not pushed to a, a reverse shoulder. You can still do a, you know, a, a, a total shoulder replacement. So what is your, why, why are you so much against hemiarthroplasty, which, uh, I mean, resurfacing, also stemless, gives a reasonable result and also the, Best point is that you don't have to go to a reverse state of it fits. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. And I have a positive case when I used to do, when I, many years ago, I was not so comfortable to work on the glenoid because to work on the glenoid is the leader more complicated. So maybe then uh, 15 years ago, I did the mostly endoprosthesis. But someone was uh, going well, someone went no, and so I had to reoperate with the glenoid component or with reverse. If you ask me, which is the patient, patient selection when you can do endoprosthesis versus anatomic, it's not clear. And now I feel comfortable surgically to work on the glenoid, and I have excellent results working with the total anatomics. So if it's possible, I try to restore the anatomy also on the glenoid, but this does not mean that if you make endoprosthesis, it doesn't work. That is my personal experience. Okay. Okay, Dr. Giovanni, one last question before we move on. Here in India, we see a large number of cases who have got a proximal humeral fracture, which is malunited. Now they come with secondary arthritis. So for such patients, would you recommend a total shoulder or would you say go straight for a reverse with a good cuff? I, I will show you most of the time I go immediately for reverse. And uh, I, I, I explain you very well because when we do, uh, when we write paper, when we write, uh, when we speak in the meeting, it's very easy to say we do anatomic and if there is a failure after two years, I do a reverse. That is very easy between me and you to speak. But when I have a patient in my office, like now, if I tell him, I do an anatomic, 
if in eight months, one year doesn't work, I shift to reverse. 90% of my patients, they go to another surgeon. Uh -huh. they, don't, uh, they don't understand. That them, okay. that, uh, I, I, I agree with you, I laugh, but that's just true. I, I work mostly private. And patients that come to me, they want to solve their problem. And it's very rare that I can say, we do another uh, surgery. They, they don't like this. They, they ask me one surgery. They want to be safe. They want to have, be pain free. They want the solution. So it's different when we speak with webinar in the meeting, when I face with my patient. This is my re real. Now I'm pushing more the reverse. Uh, to, just today, I had two, three patients. They are female, 65 with calf lesion, but very retracted, no good, no good quality. And I said to them, if you want, I do a scope, I fix the tendon. If you want, we can do an allograft, something like that. But I cannot give you 100% that in one year you will be fine. And if you are not fine, you, you deserve a prosthesis. And they tell me, doctor, but why we don't do a prosthesis immediately? I'm tired, I'm painful. I don't want to stay one year with the doubt how my surgery is. I want to be immediately fine two, three months and we do the reverse. So it's different when we make science and when we face true life. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, yes, so Dr. Yes, Giovanni, yes. there is another argument uh, uh, against reverse in a young person. It might give you a good result immediately but do you tell your patients that what I'm doing now is end of the tunnel operation? And after 10 years, you may be left with nothing. I, I, I agree completely. That's, that's the, the reason I don't push my patient. I discuss with my patients. I discuss with my patients like I'm doing with you. I never push my patient towards surgery, even, even when I do a lethargy or arthroscopic bunker. I, I always say, you can live with this shoulder but please don't play soccer, don't play rugby, and you can leave. But if you want to do this, you need this kind of surgery. These are the black side, these are the white side of the surgery. So I speak with my patients, and uh, I always say my patients, I am not magic. I cannot solve problem always 100%. We can discuss, and if you want to try an anatomic before the reverse, I'm ready to do this but you have to know that the complication rate is this one. If you shift to the reverse, as you say, maybe that in 10 years, you need new surgery. That's the, that is, is the, the landscape. And I discuss with my patient, I think that the key point in our job is to inform our patients. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Pratap, yeah, one, you, uh, Pratap, uh, you, uh, Pratap, can you hear me, Dr. Pratap? Roshan can I ask a question. Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. Dr. Yes. Javani, what is the success rate? Uh, what is your success rate? Is it the implant or is your technique? No, I think it's them both. It's them both. When we do a B2 prosthesis, no easy surgery, and you need a, a good implant, you need a modular implant with different angle, with different weight. And of course, I cannot compare my results with the results of 15, 20 years ago. Now we improved our technique, my team is better. And so, of course, I think it's a question of experience of the surgeons, but also the instrument and the modularity of the prosthesis you are using. Pratap, can you ask question? Pratap, you want to ask question? Uh, how do you suture your subscapularis after tinatomy? Yes, I, I have shown to you, I do three holes on the lesser tuberosity, and uh, I fix uh, the tendon to the uh, wires that pass through the bone okay. that I did on the lesser tuberosity, and most of the time I also close the rotator interval. Roshan, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear. Yeah, I just want to ask you one question. Um, what is your take on anatomical resurfacing? You do anymore? No, I, uh, I used the clips, you know, the clips from Arflex. That okay. is a 
that is very good. I had excellent results. The problem with the eclipse is that when you have a female with osteoporosis, the stem uh, is very short. Some, some time I had to cement that stem that is not for cement. Not for some reason, now I shift to the right prosthesis, but this doesn't mean that the resurfacing doesn't work. Regarding the resurfacing, I think that it can work, but you need to do a lot of kind of this surgery because the overstuffing is an issue. So you need to be very confident with this kind of surgery. Because I have excellent results with the right prosthesis, I have no reason to change. Okay. Thank you. Right, we can go on I next, Parag. I, I think we yeah. should go to next talk, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Gioni. Uh, he's, he's going to speak on uh, reverse shoulder, the principles and biomechanics. Let's go on to your next talk. Yeah. You can share the screen, Dr. Giovanni. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing. So I'll just mute everyone. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Can you see? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Just make it full okay. screen. Oh. Okay. Is it good? Yes. Yes, okay, yes. this is a classical example where, of course, on the left side, you can see how much different is the anatomy of the left X-ray from the right one. You, it, is, it is impossible to restore a good anatomy on the left one. When we speak about anatomic and breast prosthesis, especially to our young fellow, I want that they are very clear that to move the glenohumeral joint, you need a good fulcrum. What is a good fulcrum? Good fulcrum means a good head and good glenoid. So you need a very good head. And of course, you need the engine, the engine of the glenohumeral joint, not of the shoulder. The engine of the glenohumeral joint is the calf. So you need a good fulcrum and a good engine. The big problem in the shoulder is uh, when you miss the engine. Because if you miss the fulcrum, there is no problem. You can do an endoprosthesis. The big problem is when you miss the engine. The engine is the calf, is the subscap, is the supraspinatus, in the, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. And uh, of course, this is the basic biomechanics of the glenohumeral joint movements that was very well described by Steve Burkhardt. And he introduced the rule of the calf to keep centered the humeral head into the glenoid socket. So this is the fulcrum, the subscap, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, this is the engine. This is the perfect biomechanics of the glenohumeral joint. Good fulcrum and good engine. If you miss the engine, the deltoid is working and you have superior dislocation of the humeral head. This is very basic biomechanics, but is the key point in pest insulation. This uh, is another interesting uh, picture regarding uh, the effect of the muscles during the fracture, for example. When we have a fracture, you can have a, a lesser tuberosity dislocation, you can have a, a two-part fracture, you can have a three-part fracture. So when we speak about tendon, we have to keep in mind that the tendon, in mind that the tendon have an insertion on the bone. So when you have a failure of the bone because a fracture or because a fracture sequelae, you can have a failure of the tendon because the tendon is going to insert on the tuberosity. And you have a reabsorption of the tuberosity, you miss completely the engine. Sometimes you have only the fulcrum but the glenohumeral joint cannot work only with the fulcrum because this is the situation when you perform anatomic without the engine. 
We have a good fulcrum, but we don't have the engine that they keep the human head into the glenoid socket. This is the classic example. I have patient coming to me with this X-ray. There are no tuberosity. There is only a fulcrum. How can this shoulder work? And they are doing rehabilitation. They are doing modalities. They are doing swimming. They are doing everything. But this is a car that cannot work, cannot run, because there is not the engine. So that's the reason. It's very simple. Fulcrum. But if I miss the engine, it's a nightmare. If I miss the fulcrum, it's fine. If I have no fulcrum, I have a good engine, I can use uh, a prosthesis, anatomic one. But if I miss the engine, it's a nightmare. The only way is to reconstruct the fulcrum, inverting the shape of the anatomy. This is a, a fulcrum, new fulcrum, that is locked. And the engine is no more the cuff but is the, the, the toy. So the concept is the same. Fulcrum, engine, very human joint, different morphology, different biomechanics, but the concept is exactly the same. Fulcrum and engine is very easy, is very reproducible. So this is a classical example of the reverse. I try to make the video run, okay? We call this reverse because we reverse the anatomy. Concavity is transforming convexity just to recreate the new fulcrum. That is the anatomy of the scapular side. And this is the anatomy on the human head. We have a concavity instead of convexity. And this is the fulcrum. We do this video to explain our patient what is a prosthesis. Because it's not too easy to explain to a patient that very often are in day 70, in day 80, what is an anatomy? What is a reverse? What is a deltoid? They don't know what is a tendon. They don't know which is the difference between tendon and ligament. But very often they want to understand. And if they understand, in my experience, they are good patient if they want to understand. So once again, the anatomy of the, the scapula and the humerus is very important. This is the humerus that I show you. There is a retroversion of the head. There is a, a valgus of the neck respect to the diaphysis 140. And there is the, once again, a centricity of the center of the human head with the center of the diaphysis. The center of the human head is more medial and more posterior. And this is very important also to use in the best way the reverse prosthesis. When we use the reverse prosthesis, you, you have to remember, but I am sure that you know this very well, that one of the issue of the reverse is the notching. This is the notching. This is uh, the problem of, was the problem of the forced reverse prosthesis from Gramont. To avoid the notching, we can lateralize with lateralized prosthesis or with a bioreverse, with a graft. Another trick is uh, to shift inferiorly and laterally the glenoid using a centric glenosphere, like in this way. And once again, we can avoid the notching between the polyethylene and neck. And very important seems to be also to give, to improve the biomechanics, 10 degree of inferior inclination of the glenosphere. These are treatments to avoid the notching, but also on the humoral side, you can work avoid the notching, you can use curve or straight stem. The, cool, the more curve is the stem, the less impingement, the less notching you have. You can use onlay or inlay. Inlay is more dangerous. Onlay is less dangerous because there is more distance between the head, the, the uterus, and the scapula. 
and also working on the centricity of the humeral component, you can put more lateral, more medial, more proximal, more distal, your humeral component. So there are many, many tricks. You can lateralize the glenosphere, you can lateralize or medialize the humeral head. You know that there are many, many different philosophy according to the biomechanics. I have ready this because we are doing a lot of biomechanical study. I don't want to get bored with you, but keep in mind that when you speak about the reverse prosthesis, you can have medial glenosphere, medial humerus. You can lateralize the glenosphere and medialize the humerus. You can lateralize the glenosphere and lateralize the humerus, or you can lateralize only the humerus. In any of these uh, different configuration, there are advantage and disadvantage. And I want to show you how complex it is, anyway, to correct the anatomy, also in reverse. Try to see, try to figure out this example. You can have a very superior teeth, 80 degree, because uh, arthropathy of the calf. You have superior dislocation of the head because uh, calf lesion. So most of the time you don't have a B2 in this case, but you have a superior erosion. So there are many different tricks, how to use uh, your key wire, how to drill, and what kind of prosthesis component with the wage you can use. And very, very important in my experience in this case is to try if it's possible, especially if you have very medialized glenoid to use a bio-reverse. The bio-reverse is a very good point to improve uh, internal and external rotation because uh, you have much more tension on the calf. And of course, with the bio-reverse, you can avoid the notching. Of course, with the bio-reverse, you can correct between 10 and 15 degrees of superior tilt. Sometimes uh, if you have more superior tilt, you need to remove some inferior bone. But there is some biomechanics behind this. And uh, the technology, once again, the modular processes can help you very, very well to restore the anatomy also in the reverse prosthesis. This is uh, the bio-reverse type. And you can see that we have a lateralized component of the glenoid. When you lateralize uh, the glenoid, of course, you lose a little lever harm in the extension inflation but of course you have more tension on the calf and it's very useful, especially if you have some infraspinatus teres minor that you still attach. Any problems, Gianni? Yeah, well, sorry, but I don't know why the computer shift on the previous presentation, but no problem, we go back. Okay. Now I would like to show you some case, and we can discuss about this. So this is the classical reverse prosthesis. The Gramont style is the it's very old style. Now, as I told you, you can work with lateralized glenosphere or you can lateralize the humerus. It's up to you to your experience. But anyway, the results uh, within the first eight, 10 years with this kind of prosthesis are very, very interesting. So this is a very interesting case. This is, was a patient that was treated for this kind of fracture in another hospital. I think that you agree that is not the best orif. There are different mistakes. And uh, she came to another doctor after eight months. And the other doctor, she did this. You know, that's once again, he did uh, an endoprosthesis, but something is missing. The, the, the engine is missing. So this is a pseudo paralytic shoulder. She is very painful because the, the glenoid, glenoiditis is a pseudo paralytic because there is no more the calf. 
So which is the solution? The solution is to transform this prosthesis in a reverse prosthesis. This is the X-ray study that we did. And this is the clinical reasons. You can see good elevation is pain-free and you have to keep in mind this is the third surgery that she did. We did the last one. This is the excellent result. And uh, it's very strange that probably there is no infraspinatus, probably there is uh, no teres minor, but she has a, a good external rotation. So I think that there is something in the reverse prosthesis that we still, uh, uh, we need to understand. So we, we, we make a lot of this uh, kind of surgery. This is another case, right shoulder, irreparable massive calf lesion is an Amada one, Amada two, Amada three, is a 72 years old. You can give a look to the left shoulder. Okay. This is the right, this is the left one. You can see again that the left one, there is, is she's going to have surgery because failure of injection, because the failure of rehabilitation, she is very, very painful. I don't push this patient to the surgery. They try everything and they come to me, they say, I can live in this way. This is the X-ray before the surgery. You can see that there is a superior dislocation. And this is the, the results after two months from the surgery. She has a more or less the same range of motion, but she is completely pain-free. I tried to explain here that the bicep stenotomy could be an option, but she said to me once again, I want one surgery. I said, yes, but stenotomy of the biceps is very easy, very fast, it's arthroscopy. Doctor, I want one surgery. I don't want to anesthesia. Do you want this, uh, this, uh, this cases of a discussion? Yes. Yeah, so I, we, we can take opinion of other panelists if possible. Absolutely, that should be Do wonderful. Uh, Dr. Jiten, Dr. Jiten, Dr. Parag, can you hear me? Dr. Dr. Parag, Dr. Jitin, can you hear me? Yeah, can we can we have the case now? This is the case we're talking about. Yes, yes, yes. 72 year old female, five years, Hamada two and three on both sides. So from the x-ray, it looks quite decent, except that the uh, shoulder is dysfunctional because probably rotator cuff is not working. Yeah. But clinical picture. Uh, can you show the video? Yeah. 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 She has a good amount of forward elevation. This is after the surgery. This is after okay. the surgery. Okay, okay. Can you can you go back on his yes. her MRI? Pre-op MRI. MRI. Yeah, pre-op MRI. Yes. Yeah, you can see here. Yeah. Will you will you consider this patient for uh, superior capsular reconstruction, Dr. Gioni? In any? Yes, yes. That that could be an option. I uh, agree completely. That uh, probably also a tenotium of the biceps could be an option. Okay. Dr. Gioni. Yeah. So, you know, when you look at the MRI, there is an element of AC joint arthritis and there is some subacromial spurring. So, when you did yeah. the surgery, did you do an ACJ excision as well and did if the shaving yes. of the spur? If he's, is he, if he's painful, I do. If he's uh, pain free, I don't touch the AC joint. I, only if he's painful. I, don't, I never treat an MRI, CT, and X ray, but I treat a clinical finding. But you are completely right. From the clinical point of view is was asymptomatic on the AC job. But I, 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 I like to discuss this case because it's the classical case of a patient that she, she asked me one surgery. No, no more surgery, only one. She told me I am old, I don't want a tentative, I want something that works very well. I don't want anatomy, I don't want graft, 
I want all, I have only one surgery. And probably in my mind, this is, is like an over treatment, you know? But she's very, she's very happy. Yes, Dr. Giovanni, uh, in, in this country, I'm sure you have those kind of patients who don't want a replacement. They are quite happy with some relief. Is it possible to do something like a partial repair, tenotomy? I mean, how come your patients are okay with one operation, which may be something like reverse? Yeah, I, 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 agree, I agree. Yes, I agree completely. I agree completely. But it's, it's, um, it's different when the patient comes to you and she asks for one surgery. Okay. I, can do, I can do many things. I, I agree with you. If probably, if that were my shoulder, I would do an arthroscopy, tenotomy, and the partial calf repair. Then, if after one year I have pain, I ask my assistant to do a reverse. But if I do a tenotomy and a partial repair, and the patient comes to me and she's still painful, she's not happy with me, and she goes immediately to another surgeon, and she is convinced that Tortoni Dragom is not a good surgeon. I say mm -hmm. you this because this happened to me many times in the years. So when they ask me one solution, I give one solution. Okay. That's a That's, good learning. It's, it's different from uh, literature or what we say. It's a very tailored surgery for different patients. I think that's a great learning from you more than shoulder surgery. No, no, that's personal opinion. That's right. This is another case. This is different. This is a 76 years old. Left shoulder atropathy. We did this. The video is not uh, working. Okay. It's working. Yes, yes, it's working. A moment. A moment. The topic will have to be Dr. Giovanni, can you hear me? Yeah. So she's got a good function. There's no doubt about it. So do you have the preoperative of the rotator cuff? Of, of the which patient? This one? Yes, yes, yeah, this, this one. one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one is coming in. No. I don't, I don't have, I, I suppose that you ask me because uh, if you have a good calf, you do a uh, anatomy. Yeah. But she's 66. That's 76. right. That's the reason I do reverse. I, I, I can I cannot trust in that. Yes, but if you see that the head is not riding. Yes, but I, I agree with you. But uh, with the reverse, I am sure that this patient more or less is going well for 10, 15 years, and she is the 76. If you, I do an anatomic one, and uh, the calf, of course, could be enough good, but it's not good because uh, if this patient were 50, I would do an atomic one, but she's 67. There is no reason I run the risk to shift from an atomic to reverse. I do okay. it immediately a reverse. I, I, I agree with you that is questionable, but the reason I want to discuss this case. Okay, I have one question for you. You know, there is a lot of uh, literature saying that the humoral cut or the humeral angle on the humeral side should be now close to 135. But we've used systems which had 155, then we've had 145, 140, 135. And you see that clinically, the function is more or less the same. Do you firmly believe that 135 cut is the way forward or which is the system you're using and what is your angle? I agree completely with you. And once again, uh, when we read the literature, I think it's very important, but literature is not a law. You know, and if you have a, you use a big glenosphere, if, if you give a good inferior till, and if you distalize the glenosphere, I don't think that make a difference 135, 145, you know? And if you use a bioreverse, the notching is mostly is very rare. So I agree with you. The angle 
was very important in the Gramont type. But in these new models of uh, reverse prosthesis, I don't want to say that it's not important, but it's secondary. I agree completely with you. Hmm. Will, it make a, uh, Joe, uh, Dr. Yavane, will it make a huge difference if it's a 10 to 20 degree of retrogression change? Sorry? Will it make a huge difference if there is a, you know, a difference of a 10 degree retrogression? No retrogression. We are speaking about uh, Baruvalgus angle. Oh, sorry. Next, next shaft angle, if it's uh, going to be 145, instead of 145, if you are going to put 135, will it I make a huge difference? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. I don't think that is, uh, that, that is not the key point. I think that the big difference uh, in the prosthesis uh, is uh, very important, for example. And I'm surprised that in, in the meeting, very often we don't speak about this, but it's the posture of the patient. The worst results in my hand is the posture of the patient that is in kyphosis, usually in female, that have a very protracted scapula. So as a surgeon, very often we give a look only to the glenohumeral joint, but we miss completely the kinetic chain. I think that uh, in uh, uh, trying to figure out which could be the results of the clinical, the clinical results of a reverse prosthesis, the position of the scapula is very important. Not only how you put the element. Sometimes you make an excellent surgery, you use the best prosthesis, you are very satisfied for your work, but the, 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 the shoulder doesn't work so well because the kinetic chain doesn't work so well. So I don't think that the, the results depends only on the glenohumeral treatment but it's something that is more complex that we'll still miss to study. Dr. Giovanni? Yeah. Can you tell me? Yeah, yeah. You know, we get a lot of patients who have advanced osteoporosis. Now, when they have a chronic CTA or a cuff tear arthropathy, the bone stock is often poor. Now, in your country, have you come across situation where you've put in the glenoid component, your spiral blade and the screws, and yet you feel that the fixation is not very good. Have you come across such situations and how have you bailed yourself out from these? Yeah, that, 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 that is a, a very severe problem. Uh, I, I had only one case because a huge osteopor osteoporosis, we had the intra-operative uh, fracture of the glenoid and we had the glenoid that opened up completely. And that was a completely failure. We had a pseudopalalytic shoulder in an 80, 80 years old female. And in this case, there is no huge solution. You have to remove everything. You have to wait five, six months. And if there is a good healing with a graft, you should try to make a new surgery. But as I told you, very often these are very old patients and they are prone uh, they, they don't want to have new surgery. That was a, a completely a failure because the patient decided to keep the shoulder free fl fl um, and without any kind of prosthesis. And that the, the reason of that failure was, as you said, the, the, the osteoporotic bone. So uh, you should have always uh, to have some uh, uh, bone bank. We have the bone bank in our clinic. And uh, when uh, we have this kind of uh, a situation, we don't hesitate to uh, make some graft, to use some graft. So, Dr. Giovanni, I have problem with doing reverse in obese people, you know, who almost use shoulder as a weight bearing while shifting from bed out. They take a lot of support on their shoulders. And if they're obese, it's a bit of a worry that they might just uh, loosen up their joint. What's your advice for those patients? Yes, the only advice that I can give you in this patient, if it's possible, I use the human hand to perform a, a bio-reverse. And most of the time in this patient, I don't fix the subscap. But uh, I, I try to trust uh, if there is some remaining uh, infraspinatus teres minor to recover some external rotation. And usually I don't fix the soup scalp, especially in this patient, because most of the time they, they have a good pectoralis major, they, they, they have a good latissimus lorsis and teres major. The only advice I can give you 
is uh, try to lateralize the glenosphere with the bioreverse. So they, they, I, I call them a weight bearing shoulder, you know, kind of they're, they're loading their shoulder trying to get up. You think that's a serious problem? Yes, I think so. to get around it? Yeah. Giovanni, there are a few questions on YouTube. People are watching our channel and they requested a few questions. One of them is how do you decide for the stability of reverse shoulder arthroplasty post surgery in trough? That's that is very good point. There is a, there is not a perfect answer. It is a, um, that is the most delicate part where the experience of the surgeon is the key point. I give a look to the difficult that I have to reduce. I give a look to the common tendon and I try to see if the tension of the common tendon is, the, is enough good. And I try to test all the, the range of motion and uh, I put a finger under the prosthesis in a deduction and I try to translate the humoral component laterally. If it's stable, it works. And uh, it's very important, uh, are more than seven years or six years that we don't have instability. We are very lucky for this. And we are doing a study. And I think that the paper from Jill Walsh regarding the length of the arm and the length of the humerus is very important when you compare con with the contralateral. The issue is we are studying three different groups. One group is acute fracture in older patients where we perform reverse. The second group is calf arthropathy. The third group is a fracture sequelae or revision. I think that the Lederman rule or Jill Walsh rules where the length half of the humerus need to be more or less two centimeters longer than the contralateral works very well for the fracture and for the arthropathy. But if I follow this rule for the fracture sequelae, I have a very stiff shoulder. So we are trying to show that this rule is very good in acute fracture in a calf arthropathy. But when you are managing a revision or a fracture sequelae, you have a very huge scar tissue around the glenohumeral joint and it's very difficult to respect the length of the contralateral humerus or the rule of the length of the heart. I don't, th I don't know if it makes sense, but for the stability is very important. Yeah, and the second question is like, uh, we have the uh, reverse sh total shoulder. There is high chances of notching. So do you consider this as a day one failure and revise there and there itself? Or you like to have a good result even if you have a, a small amount of notching? Because it has uh, been uh, seen. Uh, yes, I, I, there are different papers from Jill Walsh once again. They, they show that when you had, the, now the notching is, um, is not so common. With the new processes, the notching is not so common. But uh, with the Gramont type, even if you have a notching grade one, grade two, uh, it does mean that you have a, a clinical problems. So the notching is a, a we can define the notching like an imaging failure, but not necessarily a clinical failure. Anyway, you have to follow with X-ray the notching because a, a notching grade three, grade four can disturb in an important way the glenoid. So you have to follow the notching. But with, in, with the new prosthesis, the notching, and especially with the bioreverse, with lateralization, with distalization of the glenoid, with the tilt of 10 degree, and uh, um, with different type uh, of managing the humeral side, is very difficult to have this kind of problem if you have a good prosthesis. Okay. Uh, there is uh, another question uh, which is uh, there on primary osteoarthritis of shoulder. How do you decide for TSA versus anatomic uh, reconstruction? Uh, when a, a patient, do you go on the patient age more? Because there could be asymptomatic rotator cuff tear, which is not seen in your clinical practice. So how do you decide on that? And there is not only one parameter. As I told you, when the patients are very old, uh, for me, the reverse prosthesis is, is, is working very well. So when they are over 70, there is no reason to do, even if they uh, could be a good candidate for an atomic, most of the time I do a reverse. I, I, that is my personal opinion. 
I stress the anatomic prosthesis. I, I do big effort and I am ready to run some risk with my patient where they are very young, where they are in their 40, in their 50, in their 60. I try everything and also to run some risk to use anatomic. And when they are older, I prefer to do a reverse. That is not the rule, but very often in 80% of the case, I shift forever, forever, forever. Okay, we'll go on to the next case. This is revision rotator cuff. This is a cuff that was uh, operated two years before. It was a failure. She did rehabilitation. She did uh, some injection. This is the pre-surgery. Before the surgery, you can see the right shoulder. The left one is good. This is the right shoulder after rehabilitation, after the surgery, she's not happy. And she's not happy to have a new surgery, you know? She's complaining. She's asking me why I need a new surgery after two years, because the calf was not good. I fixed the calf, but when they are 70, 80, the calf, very often the quality of the tissue is not good. You have osteoporotic bone. That's the reason very often when I am borderline, I do a reverse because they are very happy for many years. That is the clinical finding. This is the X-ray CT. This is the calf failure. And you can see here, you see, we use a large glenosphere, 42. There is some tilt, but very important is here, the offset. The, you can see it's very difficult to have a notching between here and here with this new model. 42, glenosphere, and the inferior offset is very important. The polyethylene is here. So to have a notching also in any reduction is very, very difficult. We are following our patient. This is the patient after four months, and she told me, why, doctor, you didn't perform this surgery two years before? Why mm -hmm. you did me a calf repair? Mm -hmm. You know? This is after four months. But very often, they are in this situation after a few weeks from the surgery, because uh, most of the time, I don't fix uh, the subscap, because we are doing a study on a 100 patient with Matt Provencer, he is doing reverse repairing the subscap, and I have to reach 100 Ks without fixing the subscap to see if there is some different using the same prosthesis. This is another interesting case. Is a, a sequelae of a, the iatrogenic damage of this kind of surgery. It is a 68 right shoulder. It is very painful. Is what, was surgery? Uh, what was that surgery? Uh, what was that surgery? Was it uh, for shoulder instability treatment uh, maybe 15 years before? We didn't perform this kind of surgery. It looks like an but anterior boot block with a plate or something. Sorry? It looks as though someone had done an anterior bone block procedure. Yeah, as absolutely. As yes. Like he was treated for instability with some bo blo bone block procedure. Absolutely. This is the right shoulder before the surgery. This is the reverse. Six weeks, six weeks after the surgery. But I agree with you, we have to follow in the years the patients. Maybe that in 10 years, the results are not so comfortable. I agree completely. Dr. Giovanni? Yeah? You're using this short curved stem on the humeral side, uncemented. Yeah. So these are relatively young patients who exert a lot of force on the upper part of the humerus. Do you find that the bonding with the bone is pretty good? Or have you had any stem loosening cases with radiolucencies around the stem? Yeah, I had uh, this case in a uh, um, patient, female, uh, where I use a reverse on fracture and I cemented. In those cases, I had radiolucency and I had to perform uh, uh, two revision because the fracture, because the stress shielding effect. But mostly in female, 
uh, that had a reverse because an acute fracture and I cemented because osteoporosis. Also, I noticed that you're happy with three screws on the glenoid side. So do you try to put all four or you're just happy with even two or three if they're gripping well? Uh, sometimes I stop when uh, we, you, you mean if I always use four skew of, or if sometimes I use three skew. That's right, on the glenoid. Sometimes I use only three skews, especially when the glenoid the vault is very small. And I have the sensation that the most anterior skew could be out if I use. So I use only the superior, the inferior, and the posterior one. It's up to the, the, to the stability, but most of the time the stability is very good, even also with only two, two, three skew. So I agree completely. Not always I use four skew. This is another case. Is 82, primary osteoarthritis, just to answer the question before, is 82. Right shoulder, before the surgery, once again, the X-ray. This is the, you, you, I, I, I agree with you. We, in 82, we, we could do theoretically make a, an anatomic one. Mm. Yeah, I think so, but uh, this is the CT. We always study our patient with the X-ray, CT, and MRI for a legal issue. As I told you, uh, I think that many of our practice and our habits depends also on the type of patient that you, you treat. Most of the patients I treat are private patients. They pay, they have insurance, and uh, they, uh, they pay a lot of attention. They have very strong lawyers, and I have the habit to do everything, X-ray, MRI, and CT. Because if there is some problem and you don't do the MRI, they ask you why you didn't perform the MRI. If you have some problem, you didn't perform the CT, they ask you why you didn't perform the CT. And so I do everything. I want to be safe, okay? And I, I, I have a lot of information, of course. This is once again, you, you see that there is always the inferior tail. This is very important. I think this is the key point. And this is the results after six weeks, one month and a half. They are surprised because the pain. They have a pain relief immediately, and they love this kind of surgery. I do this uh, maybe four or five reverse a week. You've got some excellent results. Tell us, uh, in all your cases, what do you do to the biceps? Do you tenotomize only, or do you do a tenodesis as well? Okay, in a female, in a female, I always, I, I, even uh, when I do a calf, in, in the female, 80% of the calf, I do a tenotomy. But when I perform a tenotomy, I always, from the subacromial space, I always open the pulley. When I treat a male patient, I do a calf or I do a prosthesis, I make a tenotomy, but I perform a subpectoralis tenodesis because I am convinced that the problem very often is not the biceps, but is the biceps into the groove. So I had the opportunity to reoperate some patient of mine where I perform the tenotomy alone, male or female, they had a painful biceps because the biceps was locked into the pulley. Then I opened in the second surgery the pulley and they have complete pain relief. So I always, if even if I do in the female because they don't make the Popeye, it's very rare in the female to have the Popeye, I perform a tenotomy, but I open the pulley. If I treat a male, I make a tenotomy and I do a subpectoralis tenodesis. So doing that, I am completely out of the pulley. And I do the same when I do a reverse, I do a tenotomy and I open the pulley is very easy, or I do a tenotomy and I fix the biceps of the pectoralis major to avoid the Popeye in male female, in, uh, in male patients. This is another case, you can see. This is a fractured okay. sequela, 60 years old. 
Once again, it's very easy. I, I love my physio. My physio, physio is a very in interesting point in my practice because I want that my physio in Italy, they understand what, what I'm doing. I wrote, I, I wrote a book, now I show you, that is post-surgical rehabilitation because the physio is the key point. The physiotherapist is important as the surgeon is important for the patient. So that's the reason I introduced on this book. I introduced the concept of fulcrum and engine. I want that if they treat a patient like this, what, 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 what you can do in this patient? Why they, they, they have to make rehabilitation for six months? It's impossible. It's completely impossible. They don't have the engine. They are very painful, and the more they wait, the more difficult is the revision case. That's the case. It's a pseudo-paralytic. But she's complaining, of course, for the wrong, but she's complaining for the pain. The human head is pushing on the glenoid. So we did this kind, I love this kind of surgery. That's the, the surgery I love more since many years, because uh, is, uh, sometimes it's not easy, but is uh, is very good for the patient if you make a good patient selection and you perform a good surgery. You see how much bone loss you have, and we could speak hours if uh, uh, you have to reconstruct the bone loss. If you have to use the bone graft, this is a case revision long stem after four months. Yes, the shoulder was the right one. This is the left. Four months is a little difficult. She needs some help. This is four months, but you can see that passively is free. 16, more than one here. Same patient, right shoulder. That's very good. And she was a nightmare. And now I ask you, how is possible that she has this external rotation? You, you, you can see here, I go back. If you have time, I go back. Look, tell me where the terrace minor could be. There is no terrace minor here. I, 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 had, uh, I have some friends like uh, George Ataval, Sotelo, they were in Rome before the coronavirus in January for the meeting. And I asked them, how is possible that this patient has a good external rotation? And they, they said to me, it's, 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 it's very, you, you can see here. Okay, where is the terrace minor here? There is no terrace minor, you see? I, I, I think there is no infraspinatus, there is no tenor minor, is missing bone for three, four centimeters, maybe more, okay? Look at the clinical results, not after four months, but after 16 months, she has a good external rotation. That's the reason I am convinced that of course, we have to pay attention locally to the glenosphere, to the varus valgus, but there is something in the scapular movement that in some patients that don't have a, a huge postural disorder like this patient, that is a very good from the postural point of view, they can have excellent results in the sternal rotation for some reason of the kinetic chain that is not so clear till now. And this is what another kind? case of reverse fracture. You want, what kind, sorry, sir. Uh, what kind of a glenosphere did you use in that patient, the previous patient? Uh, you mean... Uh, uh, glenosphere, glenoid, glenoid processes. X-ray, yeah. Yes, that is uh, from from Lima. You need uh, uh, that was a rather transparent glenosphere. Is a forty six glenosphere. Is it a ceramic one or what is yes, it? Yes, exactly, ceramic one. Okay, okay. This is a fracture. You know, and uh, yes. Another question now is, is an older patient, which is the indication in this, this is 76, 77, left. Okay, this is the surgery. I always try with a plate to try if it's possible an orif. And we used to, to make always live surgery. This was a live surgery I did during the meeting. You can see it's impossible to reconstruct this kind of bond. Is impossible because it's very technically demanding, but uh, even if you are able to reconstruct this anatomy, 
Of course, there is a huge biomechanical possibility uh, to have a biomechanical and biological failure. He is 76. So for me, in this patient, there is, of course, a rule of make a trauma reverse. This is a little difference, but the principle is always the same. You can see there is uh, some offset here, this different stem, and you can see the inclination of the glenoid is more or less 10, 15. And this is the patient after 15 months, left shoulder. Of course, the length is very important. We always measure the contralateral length of the humerus. In this patient is the key point. I measure with the special device the length where I have to put the stem. I have to respect the contralateral humerus length. This is another interesting case. So I, I want to see if there is some. OK, this is another case. You can see this is a failure. This was operated in another hospital. She came to us. We did this. And she's very young. But which is the opportunity? She's a, uh, OK, what you, what you can do in this case? She's uh, 46, 45. What you can do in this? We did this. And she's happy. She is uh, sending me picture from the motorcycle. She is doing some sport. Sometimes uh, she play tennis. This is the left shoulder, you see? She is 46. I don't, I don't have any other solution for her. But, I but Johnny, uh, do, do, don't you think there could be an early failure if you do a reverse in this uh, yeah, 45 or 46 year old female? I, I, I will follow her, but give me an opportunity, a different uh, solution. Options. Yeah. What, what do you do? After, uh, keep in mind that if you operate on this patient, when she's wake up from the from the surgery, she wants a resource. She wants a resource. And she tell me, I want to live well in the next 10 years. Then we will see. I have two um, sons. I have to work. And I need my. Uh, I need to move my arm. I, uh, what can you do? She's happy. Giovanni. Yeah. So, you know, if you go back, I mean, you've got a great result, and I agree, she's very young, and there's a high risk of it wearing out. But this looks like a head splitting fracture, which was missed, or whether it was treated adequately or not. I think here yeah, your cuff would have been reasonably good. I would have just done a shoulder hemi, bought some time, and then told her do a platform shoulder hemi. So down the line, you can replace it without touching the stem, because uh, you know she has got very high risk, and there's a lot of data to show that young people, when you do a reverse shoulder, they dissatisfaction rate is very high. And these yeah. patients, if they indulge in sporting hobbies, they wear out the plastic in no time. So yes, I mean, this is a good short-term solution, what you've offered her, but the longevity is going to be an issue. I agree with you, but when I, I look at this case and I see this image, most of the times means that the big tuberosity is not so good, is not so of good quality. And I am afraid that doing an anatomic, I miss the engine. But probably you are right. You know, there are different, there are different solutions. So I agree with you. We, we, we could try in some different way. So I have some other case. So I, I should have finished my case. I have yes, many. Yes, yes, but. Okay. okay, that was a wonderful session, Dr. Giovanni. I think we all enjoyed it. Any, any question from uh, anybody? Yes, it's very nice. Very so, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. And Giovanni. Thank you to you, my friends. It's uh, always a very, very nice. good opportunity for me to share my experience yeah. with excellent uh, oh, and dedicated surgeons like you. Yeah, it was wonderful meeting, highly attended on YouTube. Many people are asking questions on YouTube. Giovanni, as, as usual, people are amazed with your uh, kind of uh, presentation, the videos, the explanation was fantastic. I think for a beginner, this was a very fantastic meeting. Dr. Nicholas, are you there? Dr. Nicholas Santa? 
Dr. Antao, can you hear me? Or maybe probably he is not able to hear me. Dr. Antao? Yes, 